Bill, Gustavo, Tom, thank you very much. Um, fascinating, different, de depressing, I was going to say, because you're talking about vast networks, shadowy networks. By their nature, they're secretive. By their nature, they're intensely protective because there is a huge amount of money being siphoned off here. But as you've just been saying about the act, that's one strategy, at least, and maybe a precedent being set, do you think? I don't know if either of uh, you want to, to comment on this. Um, that if you target the ill-gotten gains and the people who've taken it, you name them, you shame them, you hit them where it hurts. So you clearly do hope to be setting a precedent here, Bill. Well, if people kill for money, there's nothing more upsetting for them than to have their money frozen. And it really, truly, it, and, I, and I can say, I, I, know, I can, see, I can say, um, having seen Putin's reaction to the Magnitsky Act, that he's just, he was apoplectic. He made it his single largest foreign policy priority to, to, to fight the implementation of the Magnitsky Act. And he went crazy, went absolutely crazy when it was passed. And, and what he did when it was passed, which was truly remarkable, was, was first, um, he banned the adoption of Russian children by American families as a retaliation. So he was basically ready, and, and the Russian children who are being adopted um, by American families are, are, tend to be the disabled and sick ones, mm -hmm. the ones who are getting, and, and they end up getting, the, don't get adopted in Russia, stay in orphanages if they stay in Russia, but they get medical treatment in America. So he's basically sentencing his own orphans to death in order to protect his own corrupt officials, which was a heartbreaking outcome, but it shows how absolutely terrified these people are. Tom, if there was a, a I know you, you were a, an investigator rather than a campaigner, but is there a call to action? Is there a, well, th there's a way one back? There's one that's kind of linked to that as, as well, I think, um, which is this, which is kind of gathering momentum as well, which is this notion of um, the beneficial ownership of companies. So the, the, the plumbing, I mean, there, there was an offshore layer in one of the, your... The, the there's an offshore layer in every one of... In the each <laughs> of those. There's, there's, there. There, there's no onshore layers. They don't no the, the, the bad layers. guys don't keep their money in their, in their home countries. Absolutely. Squirrel, Venezuelan funds squirreled away in Switzerland. I mean, th there, is, there are one or two arguments that can be made in favour of having um, corporate secrecy, in, in favour of there their being places where you can register a company and keep your identity as the owner completely... Mm. concealed, but they're pretty thin and there's no way that they outweigh the damage that's done. Um, so there's, uh, there's been talk in the G20, I think, about trying to have a global registry of beneficial ownership, which is actually a sort of a relatively straightforward thing to do. And you, and you simply say, if you're um, an investor whose ultimate owner is concealed, you're blacklisted from using the... So you can force transparency. You could. I mean, it's... Um, or at least begin to. You could, you could, I think you could push it in that way. There have been advances in transparency in the oil and mining industry, but not on the real plumbing of the theft. And I think that's something that people could get behind. I mean, and just as a final thought on it, we were hearing earlier about the idea of campaigns reaching out to the middle ground. Um, I think the, the moment that people might start to get more genuinely pissed off about this corporate secrecy, which can be a kind of ethereal idea, mm. is when you look at, um, when you explain to, you know, uh, a couple in their 60s in London that the reason their kids can't afford to buy a house is because vast quantities of stolen money are being pumped into Manhattan, West London, via offshore companies. And it's, uh, it's impossible to say to what extent, but it would appear that a very large chunk of house price inflation in the West is just stolen money being channeled in this way. So it, it cuts both ways. A lot of this is about making it real and making it matter to us or to the people that we're talking to. I was struck um, earlier in the day in the, in the social media action uh, workshop, Sam Barry was talking about making climate change, uh, CNN's climate change campaign. She pitched it at Millennials, I think, via Snapchat. Um, and something that struck me, I think he's, is, is Larry Diamond here. Hello. You don't know me, but I was reading <laughs> an article that I think you wrote about um, oil to cash. The, uh, it's, it's, it's a couple of years ago, a really interesting article called Petroleum to the People. And it's, I was thinking, is there anything positive we can take from this? And there was this idea. Uh, now, I didn't tell you I was going to call on you at all, but I don't know whether you can explain the, s the fairly simple idea behind it, because it's the sort of thing that might pick up in, you know, on uh, social media, you know, along millennials, what new, what, th there are also a lot of um, African states where there are oil and gas reserves, they haven't been developed yet, I think, what, about a dozen of them, largely democracies, that could become petro-states. 
and just explain to us, sorry, we don't have a mic, do we? Oh, we do, we do have a mic. So this is Larry Diamond, that's from Stanford, <laughs> and I just want him to explain his idea. Uh, sorry. The <laughs> the idea is very simple, and it has to do with the problem uh, that uh, was being described of the state not really being a state, but just a conspiracy for the looting of public wealth. And so um, there are two problems. One is most of the money is disappearing, as you described, Tom, and, uh, and as you described in the case of Russia, which is also one of the great, they're all narco states that you were talking about. Uh, uh, in the form of oil states. And um, so if the money is going to disappear, A, at least try and get some of the resources to the people in terms of um, uh, uh, cash payments to the poor. Uh, and increasingly, even in poor African countries with the mobile revolution, it's going to become possible to do that through mobile transfers through means like M-Pesa. Um, but the second point is even more important than the first, and that is um, when the oil just kind of comes into the national treasury unaccountably uh, without any documentation or any awareness on the part of the citizens uh, that it's happening, it's really no one's money. It just falls from the sky or shoots up from the ground and is there for the public officials to loot. Um, once the money starts going to the people, it's very important that they get a little notice with the payment that says, your payment was X and we have deducted Y as a tax uh, that goes back to the state And this is what Tom was revenue. talking about as well, about the contract in petrostates is often broken between the government and the people. And it's there not is about no social contract anymore. at all. If people know that it's their money, they're getting some share of it, but the larger share is going back to the state. Uh, they're going to be more incentivized to mobilize for accountability, good governance, and democracy, but because it will be even more vivid to them that it's their money that's being stolen. Larry, thank you. Um, and I'm very sorry I didn't warn you on the cameras either. It just struck me that I wanted to bring this up. Um, any point, we're now having established there's a microphone in the room that can move around. If any of you want to make points uh, about other states or about this connection between oil resources uh, and government, do, there we go, we can move, could you just tell us your, your name? There you go, if we move the mic down. My name is Sherm Teichman, I direct okay. the Institute for Global Leadership at Tufts University in Boston. Judge uh, Wolf there has begun to think about an idea of the International Criminal Courts precedent, but one on corruption. Can anyone comment if that has any uh, sensibility to it? International Criminal Court for Gustavo, Corruption. Gustavo, the idea of the International Criminal Court may be going after those responsible for corruption. Well, actually, I think the, the starting point should be the, uh, uh, what we would call uh, transitional justice. Uh, most of the countries which have gone from corrupt uh, governments into democratic governments have done it at the expense of the transitional justice. Uh, you take uh, Chile and Poland and even South Africa. Uh, most of these countries uh, have uh, done the transition at the expense of putting on, on the docket uh, the real culprits. And uh, when you mm -hmm. don't punish... Uh, you are inviting a repetition of the same phenomenon in a few years' time. Uh, in Venezuela, there is a tendency now, given that the present uh, uh, government is very weak, there is a tendency for the opposition to, to go into a transition by uh, giving the, uh, the corrupt government a way out. Uh, and uh, I, I find that uh, this is uh, extremely dangerous. If you don't punish corruption, you are inviting uh, repetition. So I feel that the first step should be the application of transitional justice in the country itself before going into a, the broader concept of an international court, which is uh, very time-consuming, much more complicated. Tom, do you think that kind of discussion will be being had in Nigeria? Um, or there yeah. may be bigger issues to deal with in Nigeria. No, right I think now. that was crucial. So Buhari, who's, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this, Buhari won the election beating Good Luck, who we sure saw before. Um, the first time Nigeria's had um, uh, an incumbent president lose 
and uh, agree to, to, to relinquish power. And Bahari made a point of signaling before the election um, to the PDP, to Goodluck Jonathan's circle, not quite in so many words, but basically in publicly saying, look, we'll just have a clean slate when I come in, there won't be a witch hunt. Bahari's a very kind of ascetic man, uh, and that's his image of, is, is of being incorruptible, and we'll see whether it's true. Um, and the, the, the trouble with that, Larry and I were discussing this yesterday, but the, the, the trouble with that is that, that that is not in his gift. Politically, yes, hmm. and, for, and, and to try to avoid the terrible violence that happened after the previous elections, yes, it makes sense to send that message to, to the, the clique that's about to lose power. But it does speak to the fact that oil petro states makes for kind of big man politics, Putin, Chavez, um, even someone like Obasanjo in Nigeria. Um, someone who would, wouldn't think twice about sending a political message like that, inherent in which is a message that he is above the law and can dictate what the prosecuting authority or, uh, or the judiciary would, would do. Right, picking up on what Gustavo said. Um, some hands at the back there. Oh, you've got the mic back there as well. Yeah, Tom Palmer from the Atlas Network. And I'd just like to raise a, a question after these great presentations about the things like the Magnitsky Act being themselves subject to manipulation. The title of Bill's book is Red Notice, and I presume it's about the Interpol Red Notice that the Kremlin used against him. They use it against many opponents. They even use it against Ukrainians uh, who are critical of the Kremlin. So they use the legal system, rule of law, on the surface to punish their critics. What mechanisms could be built in so that we don't end up with people being on lists who are in fact the critics or enemies of the regimes that can manipulate the legal system. I hope it's a clear question yeah. because there's a little irony in Red Notice being the title, the legal system was used to punish you globally. How do we make sure this doesn't become another tool in the hands of the kleptocrats and instead do what we all want it to do? Um, it's a good question because you're, you're absolutely right. I, um, uh, I, I, the Russians, just a little background, the Russians, um, uh, Putin, after, after um, the Magnitsky Act was passed, in addition to banning adoptions, the Russian government tried three times to put me on the Interpol red notice list. Um, and thankfully, uh, because my case was so high profile, Interpol turned them down. We have Ahmed Zakayev, who's sitting right here, who's also an enemy of the Putin regime. They've used the Interpol red notice against him for murder of a guy who, as I understand, is still alive. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's a very good question. The two, gu two guys that are still alive. Um, uh, so it's a very good question. The, um, well, the first thing is... Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, it's, um, ha there's a couple things. First of all, structurally, um, uh, so, so in the case of the Magnitsky Act, uh, 32 people were put on the Magnitsky list um, from... 32 Russians were put on the Magnitsky list that the United States government had had evidence of human rights abuse. And in retaliation, they put on Senator John McCain and various other people so they can't travel to Russia. So um, <laughs> now it's not an equivalent. So, uh, so and, and, and as I started my presentation, I was expelled from Russia and declared a threat to national security for no reason other than, than attacking their corruption. Corrupt regimes won't let you into their countries. We don't have to let them into ours. So it's not, it's, it's not, it's not as if they can... Uh, Russia can't ban you from traveling to America. It's not like an Interpol type of situation. Having said that, um, there is some concern. So what, what, is the, um, what is the fairness of something like the Magnitsky list? And I, what I can say is that it's almost impossible to get somebody on the Magnitsky list. The, the um, standard of proof um, is so, so beyond anything for a normal crime that, it, that it's, it's, it, it requires almost a Herculean effort to get somebody, which means that they aren't randomly putting on people, people on the list. And if you get put on the list, and you get put on wrongly, you can you can appeal it, and that's written into the law. And so, um, uh, all laws need to be done fairly. But but I would argue that um, it's better to have a law against bad guys than not um, in in the in the fear that someone's going to treat it or abuse it. Um, we've got a microphone over here. I, one other point is I don't know if there's any if there's a Norwegian angle. Anybody from Statoil in the room who would like to <laughs> provide a perspective? Because as we're sitting in an oil-rich state, mm -hmm. it might be rather good to hear a perspective on combating corruption in petro-states and make the point that we're not generally 
equating oil with corruption. But your then it's a good thing I'm asking the question. Because <laughs> my name is Ola Elvestun, I sit in Norwegian Parliament, and I Excellent. chair the Committee on Energy and Environment. And my question is exactly on if you can elaborate a little bit more about the role of the international multinational oil companies. Because <laughs> uh, in my position, of course, we have discussion with, with Statoil, which is a major player in Angola. And they also a, have big stakes also in China Nigeria. Nigeria. And, and that is the question, because when we talk to them, I mean, they uh, emphasize their transparency, that they have a very clean operation, but at the same time, it seems like it's kind of like a self-proclaimed naivety within it. Because it's how can a company have a clean, how can they have a clean operation within a country that is 100% corrupt? So can you say a little bit more about the role of the multinational oil companies? Yes, yes to Tom. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, how much do you want? The <laughs> <laughs> there's a book. <laughs> a <laughs> lot. Um, an interesting thing on Statoil that I didn't get particularly into, but there's a Norwegian journalist who's been working on it, is the, um, one of their local partners is China Sonagol, is Sam's operation, which I always think is pretty, pretty interesting and worth more, more pursued. I think you're right that, uh, about that. What did, you say, what did you call it? A kind of um, self-imposed naivety. naivety. Yeah, I've heard... An, a absolutely, I've heard a banker call it... Um, Manufacturing deniability. So before they go into... So typically you get oil rights by you, you three ways. You either just stitch it up in private, you go through an auction process, or you buy a smaller company that's already got those rights. Um, and in all, all of those cases are hugely open to abuse. In Nigeria, there's repeatedly been cases of uh, auctions where a, a senior general or... Uh, a the oil minister himself, in one case, was awarded the, the block, which is effectively was the, the most lucrative facts possible. I mean, mm. it's simply the transfer of a piece of paper, and that can be, in, in one case it was, I think, um, a billion dollars. And then they just immediately sell them on to one of the big multinational oil companies. I think in that case it was ADAX, in, in the case of the general, that, um, uh, that actually has the, the know-how to to develop it. Now, in theory, you, that's illegal, especially for any company that's registered in the US. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, you can't give money or offer anything of value to a foreign official to win business. And in theory, you should go through a due diligence process whereby you check the ultimate owner of the company you're buying, and if it is the official or the president's niece or whatever, you can't proceed with that tr transaction. But it's a very flawed process, and again and again, um, Every year, the, the fines companies are paying in the U.S. Under, these act is, under this act is going up. It's a different question whether that's the right way to pursue them. Um, but repeatedly, we've seen situations where all multinationals have gone ahead. Cobalt International Energy, for instance, in Angola, w went ahead, bought a company that was owned by, uh, went into business with a company that was owned by Manuel Vicente and others. And just as a, as a, as a final thought, that's the kind of transactional side of it. But there's also the, the layer on the ground. I mean, the role of Shell in the, in the Niger Delta, they've been there for, for more than half a century now. And I spent a lot of time getting to know the, the militiamen in, the, in the, the Delta's kind of simmering oil war that's been going on in earnest for uh, nearly 20 years. And a lot of them would say, look, I don't need to print my name. And you, you don't understand who they were. You'd be meeting them in some hidden bit of Port Harcourt or out in the in the creeks, and they'd say, look, I don't want you to print my name. And normally, these people are very keen to publicize themselves, and they say, we don't want I don't want you to, one in particular said, I don't want you to print my name because it would mess up my business with Shell. And um, Shell, very reluctant to talk about this, but clearly, a lot of the boys on the ground believe that they're part of a conflict economy in which they're paid protection money by the multinationals to bomb someone else's pipeline. Um, so from the, from the top level of the... Uh, business trans corporate transactions, down to the very lowest layers of the, of the resource wars in Africa. The multinationals are deeply complicit, I would say. I think this is a point at which I'll gather up a few more points um, rather than answer the single question. We'll, take, we'll hear a few. Ahmed, you've got the mic over there? Uh, yes, I have a question for Tom Burgess. 
Uh, I want to follow up on your fantastic idea of combining the uh, uh, global Magnitsky Act with some kind of global index of the real owner of shady corporations based in Singapore or other uh, fiscal, fiscal paradigms. Uh, but this is, as a journalist and an activist, this is just a daydream. I mean, this is the holy gra grail of many people in this room, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I want to hear some more thoughts of you uh, on how to achieve that. I mean, how can you uh, effectively campaign for breaking uh, uh, corporate secrecy and lead to this situation? And just the point uh, from Amir next to you. Um, and uh, and then pass the microphone back, and we'll take a point Are we doing only questions or comments? It can be it can be either. It can be you know throw okay. them in, and then we'll, we'll so have just a final round of answers. Two uh, two brief points. The first one very quickly. Um, there is an organization called Witness that I found out about from TED um, last year while I was in Vancouver, and they're trying to lobby you know different governments to change the law, starting with the UK, to make sure that transparency. Um, is enacted when it comes to the owners of companies, and they understand that yes, in some cases you need secrecy, but in most cases, you know, in most cases they're trying to eradicate it and actually create an index of, of companies and change the law. So it's it's very important, I think, to take a look at them. It's called Witness. They're based in the UK and they're doing some very good work. Um, the second thing actually is about you know the complicity of oil corporations. So I studied in Petronas University in Malaysia. Um, it's a Fortune 500 company owned by the Malaysian government. It's an oil and gas company, very prominent, and they invested billions in northern Sudan, where I'm originally from. And I can speak about that only because that's that's only what I'm aware of. But they realized that if they wanted to go in and compete, you know, they're competing with Chinese state-owned um, oil companies. And those guys literally have budget set aside for bribery, which they call commissions, mm. or you know, um, they, they give them other fancy terms. But they're basically um, bribery budgets set aside. So Petron has figured out, okay, if we're going to go in, we need to do something. And they came up with a very smart idea because at the time, Petronas was led by CEO Hassan Marikan, who was brilliant, and you know, um, the the company was um, um, basically recognized for its transparency by numerous international watchdog groups. So they started giving out scholarships, initially to kids whose parents were in the regime. And they weren't very good academically, I can tell you that. They were partying all the time. Yeah. But eventually, they started giving the scholarships to a lot of very competent students in big numbers, very generously, setting up schools, libraries, free textbooks. And people on the ground noticed, and they really started liking Petronas, and they started purchasing Petronas products more, and actually increased their market share. So it's a very smart way of kind of going in and you know gaining favor, but I think uh, in a more ethical way. Thank you. And if you want to, would you just pass the mic back and at the back of the room, if you just tell us your name, and we'll make that. Anybody else want to make a point? We'll um, take a final point and then. Hi. You talk. Just in the interest of time, um, this is an invitation rather than a statement of opinion. Um, one of the most difficult things is like going after Russia. I mean Russia. <laughs> Super, like uh, power of nuclear weapons or regimes that are completely entrenched, very difficult. If, and this is the invitation goes to those who are working on corruption. If you're looking for a place that is a low-hanging fruit, tons of indicators of corruption that nobody cares about, that you can make an example of uh, in order to show the people the potential for the fight of corruption, come see me. Thank you. <laughs> um, Tom, we want to put that point to you about is there, is there a call to action here that people like the many activists in the room can work on? The idea yeah, of no, it's, 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 it started, it was in the Labour manifesto in the U last UK election, was um, a, a registry of beneficial ownership for all UK companies and crucially all companies in the Crown dependencies, right? So a lot of the, a, a very large chunk of the offshore tax havens in the Caribbean and the Channel Islands are ultimately run by the Queen. Um, so you could p it's only going to work if it's global, obviously, because if you just shut off one section of it, mm. it'll move to Black Liberia or, Ma or Mauritius or Singapore, wherever it may be. But, um, I mean, it's been in a, in, in, in a manifesto of a major Western party that admittedly didn't win the election, but that's a sign of the level of momentum that there is behind it. And I think, just to repeat myself very briefly, I think once people start to realise that it's not simply people in far-off lands being fleeced, but what that mischievous money does when it arrives in the property markets in the, in the, in the West or in Hong Kong or wherever it may be, that, um, that there'll be more of a connection and that as a campaign it could, it could gather more steam. Is that, is that, if that makes sense? Huh? Yeah, it was in the it was in a manifesto. I think I think Obama's talked about it. 
the Conservatives in the UK had a version of it whereby they would have a registry of ownership, but it would be private, which rather defeats the point. Mm. But you could, <laughs> you could, in theory, get, it, get at it if you're in law enforcement or, or what have you. But I think people like Nicholas Shackson, who wrote Treasure Islands, a very good book about all of this, are, are, um, and the Tax Justice Network, and these people are, are pushing this cause quite strongly already, I think. Um, I'm going to tell you all about $100,000 in just a minute, but first I want to put to Gustavo and Bill uh, the point that we haven't really raised very much so far, which is the price of all oil is falling, <laughs> plummeting. You referred, Gustavo, to the fact that that is leading the state to divert its energies, perhaps, because it's worried, because it can't rely on this anymore. But I do also want to put it to Bill that, you know, perhaps President Putin's being curtailed, his wings are being clipped. What with Ukraine, sanctions and the falling price of oil, perhaps we shouldn't be quite so worried. I'll <coughs> just hang on a moment. Gustavo, your thought first. Well, actually, before, before discussing sure. that, I, I would like just to mention briefly <coughs> the influence of the multinationals in in these countries with high levels of corruption. I think the main problem is not so much the role of the multinationals as the desire of the governments to control. Uh, uh, in Venezuela, for example, the multinationals have a very minor role uh, because the Venezuelan government wants to control totally what is going on mm. in oil. And, and the same applies to other countries with high levels uh, of uh, corruption. Now, the, the decline in the price of oil nowadays, of course, has to do with oversupply. OPEC uh, has lost uh, the capability to influence uh, prices in, in the market. Uh, the U.S. has become a, a powerhouse in, in production. Uh, so uh, the, the axis of power uh, has been displaced uh, from the Middle East uh, into the Western Hemisphere. Now, if you, if you add all the oil resources of the Western Hemisphere, they are now bigger than the ones in the Middle East or even in the ones in Russia or, uh, or Iran. So, uh, but uh, this has happened before. You have had decline in oil prices and, and, and then uh, increases in oil prices. The difference uh, uh, this time around is that uh, other things are happening. There are technological forces uh, which are acting to, uh, to replace uh, oil as a major uh, power in, in the energy sector. You, you have now electric uh, cars, uh, you have uh, uh, hydrogen batteries, uh, you have uh, solar uh, power being captured and transmitted uh, wireless. You have all kinds of technological things which are uh, threatening the dominant uh, role of petroleum mm. in, in, in the global uh, scene. And you also have environmental work, uh, forces at work. Uh, uh, if, if, if you want to keep uh, the global warming to two, two degrees centigrade above the, the current one, most of these uh, heavy oil deposits in the world will have to be left uh, as uh, stranded assets. They will never be produced the uh, Orinoco heavy oil and the uh, uh, Canada uh, tar sands and some of the Russian heavy oil will never be produced. So this is also acting. And of course, the, the, the fracking in, in, in the United States, which produces a very light oil and a lot of gas, and gas itself is the main enemy of oil uh, because it's a much cleaner... Uh, it would be a very different canvas if we came yes. back and talked about it in a few years' time. Yes. <coughs> um, Bill... Finally, so, President um, Putin wings being clipped or not really? Um, so, so President Putin is is um, the the biggest kleptocrat in the world. We've talked about a lot of kleptocrats, but uh, just in, in terms of raw numbers, in terms of how much money he's stolen, he's stolen more money than anybody. And he was able to get away with it when the oil price was rising. When, it, when it, he came in, when at, at like the bottom of the um, oil price, 1998, there uh, there was a crash, then the oil price started rising and rising, and the, and the Russian people um, didn't so care so much about his kleptocracy as they were getting better off each year, because a little bit of that money was going to them. Not a lot, but a little bit. And the average Russian said, you know, I don't care what he does. As you know, this, this year I can go on a vacation for the first time. I couldn't last year. Next year I could buy a car. I couldn't. So I'm going to keep my head out of politics because I'm getting better off. All of a sudden, oil prices, um, 2008 comes, oil, global financial crisis, oil prices go down, they come back up, they stabilize. 
And um, people start grumbling and they say, wait a second, uh, there's no schools, there's no hospitals, there's potholes in the road, life is not so great, and this guy is stealing all this money. And then all of a sudden he switched seats with Medvedev. Um, he was the, n not the president for a brief period of time and he becomes the president and they, just, and, and they announce it in the most sort of arrogant way. And people poured out into the streets of Moscow and said, enough is enough. And so because of the oil price not going up, um, uh, people poured out into the streets. He became scared of his own people. And then the thing that scared him most was watching a kleptocrat right next door, um, Yanukovych, getting run out of town for doing exactly the same thing on a smaller scale because there, there uh, wasn't as much money to steal in Ukraine. And at that point, he then said, we need something to distract the people because they're going to come and overthrow me just like they did in Ukraine. And that's why he started a war. When, when he started the war, there's now sanctions. Oil prices are down 50%. So, so everything has to do with oil. Oil prices are down now, now 50%. So what does that mean? That means two things. One is that he's in deep trouble economically, and, and his people are angrier and, and will get angrier as, as, they, as they have less to live off of. And at the same time, because they're in deep tr trouble and angry, he's going to be doing more and more of this aggressive stuff. And so it's a double-edged sword. We're, we're going to see the end of Putin. It's a much more brittle situation. I don't know how the end is going to come. It's gonna, not going to come in a, in a peaceful way. Um, uh, and the, and the worse it gets, the more angry and violent and awful he's going to be. And, and I, I, I dread to see what's going to happen in the future compared to, to, I mean, to, to the peacefulness that we've had so far. Gulp, what a note to end on. Not quite ending, though, because Saul has asked me to draw your attention to um, this. As we've been talking about anti-corruption efforts, transparency, accountability, and campaigning, um, there is uh, something called the Allard Prize for International Integrity. We'll get the OFF account to tweet a link to it, I think. Um, but the Allard Prize is worth, in Canadian dollars, $100,000. Awarded every two years to an individual movement or organization that's demonstrated exceptional courage and leadership in combating corruption. They're looking for anti-corruption efforts, the promotion of transparency, the promotion of accountability, and the rule of law. And it's allardprize.org. Um, I'm sure there are s several people in this room um, to whom this might apply. So that was a thought that Thor wanted me to draw to your attention. Um, thank you for listening. And thank you, Bill, Gustavo, and Tom, for really fascinating contributions. Thank you.